second. I'm going to begin recording the session. We still have some people joining us from the waiting room, so thank you so much for coming in. And since we cannot hear you or see you, we are going to start with a quick poll so we can get to know you a little bit better. So I'm going to start the first poll question. What is your child's age? You can select more than one answer if you have more than one kiddo at home. So we'll give everybody a few minutes. I see people responding already. Thank you so much for your participation. Got a lot of people joining us this evening. This is great. All right, I'll give it a few more seconds for people who are just coming in. Uh, we've got a poll up on the screen so we can get to know you guys a little bit better. And I'm gonna end the poll in just a second here. I see some more people joining, so I'll give them a chance to respond. And this will help our presenters know uh, who you've got at home so that they can give you some examples that will help for your kiddos. So I'm gonna share the results here. We've got a, a good range of kiddos here this evening with us, families, so thank you so much. And I've got one more question for you, and then the quiz will be over. <laughs> um, who is supporting your child during distance learning at home? And you can select more than one option if you have uh, multiple people who are helping to provide the distance learning support. So mom, dad, your grandparents, sibling, tutor, babysitter, maybe school staff or childcare staff, let us know who's helping you out. Again, this will help our presenters get to know you better. So thank you so much. I still see some people joining us. So thank you and welcome to the webinar. All right, I'm gonna give a, a few more seconds for people to respond and then I'll end the poll. All right, I'm gonna share these results out. So we have mom and dad, babysitter and school staff helping us this evening. Okay, so um, once again, the session is being recorded. We will post the recording on the MEBI website and send the link to you as well as a follow-up. And um, we can't hear you or see you, so send a message in the chat if you have any questions or comments for us. And now I'll pass it over to Angela to get us started. Hi everybody, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, this is webinar two of our three-part series on our distance learning. Today, we're gonna to be learning all about how to modify and adapt um, to help your child be most successful at home. So uh, we realize these are tough, tough times. We know that um, distance learning is um, certainly a stressor for a lot of our families, which is why we chose to go about and, and create these webinars and certainly present them and provide some hopeful, helpful tips and tricks for you all to make distance learning a little bit easier at home um, and certainly, um, uh, our staff are working to collaborate really well to give you a well-rounded experience and, and some really great uh, take-home tips that we hope are going to be helpful today. So some introductions. Uh, I'm Angela Ochoa. I am the MEBI Clinical Director for Occupational Therapy. Um, I joined MEBI as the OT Clinical Director in November of 2019. Um, I'm newest to sort of the MEBI party, I like to say. Um, MEBI is, uh, has very great, wonderful background with um, providing ABA services, uh, speech and language pathology, and now I'm very, very um, fortunate to also bring occupational therapy to our MEBI team. Um, I've been an occupational therapist in San Diego for about 12 years now. Um, I've worked all over a um, variety of different um, settings, outpatient clinics, uh, non-public schools, hospital settings, school districts, things like that. Um, and I'm very happy to work in a wonderful environment like we have here at MEBI um, that's truly collaborative among disciplines. A lot of the suggestions you're gonna be hearing tonight Tonight are across disciplines, both um, for certainly behavioral supports as well as occupational therapy services, and then certainly um, our speech therapy services. So a lot of what we're having here is going to be well-rounded, and I have to say that I'm very fortunate because I get to do this all the time <laughs> in my therapy sessions with my clients, as well as um, you know collaborating with the professionals that you see here tonight. So thank you, and I'll hand it over to Tammy. Hey everyone, um, so my name is Tammy Liu and I've been working with MEBI uh, for a little over three years and actually MEBI was my first exposure to ABA. I got involved because a former employee said, hey, I'm leaving, but this company is great and I can see you working with kids 
and also you speak Vietnamese, so that's perfect. <laughs> um, so, and I said, well, I need a job, I'm graduating. So yeah, I'll do it. I came into maybe, I kind of just fell into this, well, I wanna do this and I'm just I'm gonna go to school and I'm gonna keep doing this, become a supervisor. So I recently got promoted to program supervisor, which is why my picture looks different. And I don't have an official employee photo yet, um, but hopefully I'll become a BCBA soon. And that's, that's the goal. Hi, my name is Crystal Thielen. Um, I am a clinical supervisor in San Diego. I am also a BCBA. I've been with maybe a little over two years. Um, previously, I was living in Chicago and um, I've been in the field of ABA about eight years now. So I love it. I'm so happy. I've been helping people all across the lifespan between the ages of two and about 70. So I've helped all sorts of people with all sorts of different personalities and it has been wonderful and I love being able to share that experience at maybe and help people across the lifespan and just transition into different parts of their life. <clears throat> so a little bit about maybe we'll give you a little bit of a background first. Maybe is all about being me. So we try to integrate research-based strategies with very intense personal attention to provide therapy. We really individualize these services. We provide a very collaborative environment. I really enjoy being able to work with parents, being able to work with the OTs, the speech pathologists, the registered behavior technicians, being able to work in that collaborative environment. I work with teachers. We really try to individualize those needs, try to engage in that collaborative relationship in order to ensure that these services are individualized and that we're able to customize those needs that your child is needing at that time. We do provide ABA. We provide ABA both in home and in our new learning center, which is where I am right now. Um, in the San Diego location, we also provide occupational therapy, thanks to Angela, and we provide speech and language therapy as well. Um, in some of our other locations, we do provide ABA in all of the locations, and we are providing some telehealth services in the other locations as well. We have locations in San Diego, Los Angeles, the Bay Area, Seattle, and we are expanding to Denver as well, and we just opened in Phoenix. And if you would like more information about us or to engage in some of those, um, some of our fun little tidbits that we have on Instagram and Facebook, you can follow us on that via Maybe Family, or you can gain more information on maybefamily.com, or you can contact Michaela, our receptionist, at the phone number listed, and she can kind of help you out and figure out if our family works for your family. Okay, and then today's topics, part one, we're going to do a little bit of a recap on that. We will talk about attention, what it is and how to measure it, what that might look like for both distance learning and just trying to get your child to finish some homework that they need to finish, to sit down and actually be able to attend and work on some of those things. We'll talk about visual schedules and the use of other visuals, um, taking breaks, we all need breaks, um, chunking, so how we can break down some of those tasks for success. Um, Miss Angela will be talking about posture and how we can set our child up for success with their body and some more helpful tips as well. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, we, the, this is series two of our three-part series of distance learning and helpful tips and tricks at home. To recap just a bit, what we referred to, what we reviewed in part one is um, some things about how to get your child to the table. So today we're going to be focusing on how to keep your child engaged at the table and how to set them up for success with the activities being presented. Part one was all about getting your child to the table, especially we find that parents are like, we know we have a lot, to, a lot of work to do and it's hard enough just to get them to the table. So some of the things that we discussed then were talking about things like being prepared, some tips and tricks and strategies to reduce distractions, as well as set up supportive seating options at home to really set your child up for success. Um, the opportunity to also provide some ownership and some choices for tasks. We realize that part of the challenges for children coming to the table is 
not wanting to do it. It doesn't sound like fun, <laughs> what we're doing. Distance learning is hard. And so getting your child to the table is tricky. So developing strategies and, and allowing your child the ownership and, some, and some, some choices in the matter. So what are we gonna work on first? Are we gonna do math or language arts? Are you gonna sit in the red chair or the blue chair? Are, you, are we gonna have a snack at 10 a.m. or a snack at 11 a.m.? these types of choices provide ownership for children which gives them some strategies and some real buy-in to what we're having them do which is challenging and then we also introduced topics of visual supports the idea of how we can develop a schedule for your child to allow them to be successful we're going to delve a lot more into that topic today um, both crystal and tammy have some really great strategies within aba of how we can set your child up for success for recognizing what's expected of them at the um, at the table and what's expected of them for the day and the other thing is to talk a little bit more about the types of breaks that are going to be supportive to your child's learning. So if you would like to learn more about getting your child to the table, we certainly recommend taking a look at our series one webinar. Um, those of you that attended, thank you. And those of you that weren't able to attend, you can certainly reach uh, that information at mebefamily.com or you can reach out to us anytime and we can send you those links. All right, so since we're talking about how to keep your students engaged, or your children, our students engaged um, in their schoolwork, we thought we would take some time to look, about, look at attention and what that really means. Um, we all have an idea of what attention looks like. And often that tends to mean eye contact, or in this case, eyes on the screen. But the reality is, whether or not someone's actually paying attention when they're making eye contact or looking at the screen is really variable. Uh, if you consider if you're, when you're watching a movie or reading a book, and sometimes you're, you're doing it, you're going through those motions, even driving a car, and you're processing everything, you obviously are looking at the road, but two minutes later, you're thinking, wow, I don't remember anything that just happened. I wasn't paying attention. And so that can happen with our kids too, where they may be in the classroom, they may be looking at the screen, maybe even doodling so it looks like they're taking notes, but they're not. <laughs> they're, they're not paying attention. And of course, there are some students who don't look like they're paying attention. Maybe they're turning their ear over to a speaker. Maybe they're so busy um, engaging in like twirling their pens and fidgeting with their hands, but actually they are hearing everything that's being said. And so we want to talk a little bit more about how maybe we can use other methods to judge whether or not our, our children are paying attention. And there's one more note that I want to make about eye contact. It's that there is research showing that some people, um, at least those on with, with autism, for them, eye contact can actually activate parts in the brain that uh, correlate with physical discomfort. And there are reports of even pain. So for them, it may be that making eye contact or looking at the person is actually more distracting than not. And even for some of our kiddos, they get overstimulated and there's so many details in your face that we take for granted often where it's like, oh, the curves of your mouth, the wrinkles around your eyes, um, I don't know, the specks in your eyes, uh, and those could also be distracting. So we wanna think about that when we think about, well, why are they not looking at the screen? Why are they not looking at their teacher when the teacher's talking? So we could instead try um, watching if our kids are orienting towards the speaker or the source of sound, right? Are they, is their body turned towards the computer or are they completely somewhere else talking to someone else, which obviously if they're talking to someone else, they're not paying attention. Um, are they remaining in the area? Some of our kids might do better with maybe pacing back and forth, um, walking around, but if they are out of earshot, of course they can't hear anything. And it's possible that they're still paying attention if they're sitting around the area and they just need to keep their hands a little busy. We can judge based on if they're following instructions. So if the teacher says, take out a piece of paper and a crayon and the kid's just sitting there, maybe they're not paying attention, but of course maybe they just didn't hear it, didn't understand it. And so those are still things that you would wanna keep track of. We call it information. Um, if your kids are verbal, we can ask things, or verbal, vocal, if they talk, you can ask questions like, hey, what did this teacher just say? That's assuming that you're not interrupting what teachers, while the teacher's talking. Um, you, if they're learning about numbers, you might be able to say, hey, show me number five, and that 
you know, your, your student doesn't have to talk, they can point to the number, if you have a number line or anything like that. Um, you can say the color of this square is, and they can tell you, uh, they can match the word, green, orange, whatever. And so those things um, will allow you to kind of see, hey, did you pay attention during class when you were learning about colors today? Did you pay attention when you were learning about um, new words? Um, but of course, again, that's depending on your child. And we're going to talk so much about individualizing things today. But it is possible that maybe your student was paying attention and forgot. Because we always, we all of us, I think, will forget things here and there. And that's something to consider too. So I'll pass it on to Crystal now to talk a little bit more. So now that we talked a little bit more about the attending, we want to know how do we make that attending easier? That is such a huge issue right now, especially with distance learning, trying to figure out, okay, how can I just get my child to attend? Um, one strategy is breaking it down. First, by starting by breaking down the instruction. So sometimes we might get stuck where we're like, okay, you need to go sit down, you need to open up your computer, you need to get on Zoom, you need to do this. Sometimes using all of those words can be really overwhelming and that can, sometimes some of our words can get lost with some of our learners too. So just trying to break it down, making it simple, um, going to um, even making it into a first then. So first, let's sit down, then we'll open up our laptop or just focusing on that one word, even pairing um, gestures sometimes with that as well can be really beneficial just to provide that clarity, just to make those instructions as clear and concise as possible and to provide that visual too with the pointing, with tapping the table if that's where they need to go, just to provide them that extra little prompting and that help and breaking it down so that it is a little bit more manageable rather than um, them focusing on this big long chunk of eight things that they have to do that they might not remember or that might be a little overwhelming for them. Um, also breaking down the tasks in general. So maybe for worksheets or for a book, this might look like, okay, we're going to work on a few problems first and then we'll stop and we'll take a break or breaking it down to where maybe we're folding the paper in half and we're only working on half of it right now and then we'll do the other half later um, maybe breaking a book down into a few different parts with a little um, a bookmark to show where we're ending breaking tasks down like that rather than having them sit there and complete the whole activity at once and for distance learning this might look like um, breaking that time interval into chunks, which I know can be really difficult because we don't want to miss any of what the teacher is talking about. We don't want to miss those learning opportunities, but we also don't want to miss um, those reading our, our children's bodies and understanding like, okay, they, I think they need a break right now. Um, possibly pre-scheduling some of those short little breaks so that they can take that, that time away. Um, maybe 15 minute chunks and then scheduling there, although they might need a little bit more depending on the child. Um, the plan is to be a little bit proactive as much as possible, but also stopping before that threshold. So if you know that your child is not able to sit for a full 15 minutes, maybe stopping around like the 12 minute mark, being like, oh, okay, let's go take a break. Let's break this down a little bit. Um, I think sometimes we can increase that attending that way. We can get more of that attending behavior if we just step back and take a few more breaks for some children. Um, another strategy is building the momentum. So sometimes starting with some of the easier tasks and building forward to the more difficult tasks. So even for us, we start our day a little bit slower and build up to some of those more difficult tasks that we might not want to deal with. So for a super young learner, this might look like um, doing something that we know that they can do right away. So it might be like, okay, let's do a jump, sit down, grab a pen, and trace this letter. So breaking it down as soon as they complete that activity, moving on to that next easy activity, and gradually building up to where it's starting to get more difficult. This can kind of help instill some confidence in them. It can build that momentum. It can help them feel successful because they're able to complete some of those little activities building up to that more difficult one. And it can kind of help them celebrate some of those small wins and also give them a little bit of less time to actually think about 
how hard that next activity is or transitioning into that next activity because at that time they're just focused on some of those easier tasks. Um, and then finally, making it fun. So I know Shelby in the previous um, presentation talked about having fun transitions. So when we are getting to the table, um, running to the table, racing to the table, um, making it a race, just um, making that just a little bit more engaging and fun rather than being like, all right, we have to start right now. We have to go to the table right now, just to try to increase that, those positive associations with that area and with the experience in general. Um, also just for the area, making it appealing, but also not too distracting either. Um, we don't want toys everywhere. We also don't want them to be in an area where maybe there are toys on the ground or they can easily just run over and grab some cars or grab some of the other toys that are way more appealing than that distance learning at that time. So trying to make that area not super distracting, um, but maybe having some special items that are only reserved for distance learning that aren't too distracting. So having maybe their special blanket or a special fidget or um, Tammy provided the idea of maybe they have a little stuffed animal that helps them during distance learning that will sit with them and that will learn with them um, and that can kind of engage with them. So um, maybe some having some of those activities, some special snacks that are just reserved for that distance learning to help them enjoy that experience a little bit more and to just provide that extra little support for them. Um, it could also look like having a whiteboard where they can kind of write their letters along with the parent or with the teacher or maybe if mom and dad are able to sit in the session as well um, being able to follow along with the teacher having a whiteboard if teacher is going over letters or if they're going over math sitting there with a whiteboard and trying to follow along with that um, i know that's not feasible for all families but it could be a possibility for some um, and the key is just trying to figure out how we can make them want to attend rather than trying to force them to attend, um, trying to make that experience as positive as possible and figuring out how we can um, determine what those little factors will be that will help push your child to make that attending easier. And um, Crystal, we did get a question in the chat box. So um, speaking of setting up your environment, so someone asked about um, how to help manage younger siblings or maybe other kids in the house who may be distracting the student who should be learning, maybe they want to get on the Zoom. So um, is there, do you have any tips for helping to manage the other siblings in the house um, who may be distracting the, the child who should be doing their Zoom or um, distance learning lessons? Yeah, I think one strategy could be for the siblings is to, um, one recommendation I provided was having like a special little box full of special toys or um, maybe some arts and crafts or little activities like that for the sibling off to the side to only pull down during this time so that it is super likely that they'll engage with it so that they'll really um, be likely to kind of take that and go off into their own space during those times um, and trying to get them to where, okay, maybe they'll be a little bit more distracted with some of these, some of these novel activities that they don't get access to all the time. Just to um, maybe add on to that too, Crystal, um, one of the, this was a really popular question too at our previous series and some of the other things that we brainstormed too was we talk a lot about how the distance learners focus needs to be really structured and how a lot of things that can support them in the environment, things like timers and other visuals that can support them. And we're going to talk a lot more about that today. But certainly those same strategies can be effective for other kids in the household too. So a lot of times what happens is we might recommend using a timer that has a really clear visual to it. We're going to talk a lot more about that in the next couple of slides. But essentially what that does is instead of using a, maybe a, a regular timer or using an analog clock or something, the visual timers that have those you know, big bright red circles. And as the circle, as the time goes, the circle gets smaller. And what that helps too is really identify this is how much time we have left. And so for our younger kiddos that can maybe use those supports in the, um, in the home might also be supportive for them as well. This is how much time brother has before it's now your turn. So we need to be aware of that. Oh, 
there's still a red circle, that means we're not done yet. You know, time to go back to whatever fun thing you're doing, brothers on the, on the, on the iPad or the tablet, you get to do this um, and, and working that way. We know it's not easy and seamless. And so we're going to come up with some other strategies, but certainly a lot of these strategies that can be helpful for your distance learner may also be supportive um, for your other kiddo at home too. Cause we know that's really tough. And a lot of times parents are juggling so many things in the home um, and recognizing some of these supports um, may also really help you out too. I totally agree. Yeah. These strategies aren't just um, catering toward the distance learners or um, doing homework in general, but being able, they can be generalized for sure to siblings. These are strategies that we use with all types of people um, on the spectrum and not, or all, I know I use a lot of these strategies for myself as well. So they can definitely be generalized and we can try to reframe them in order to think for some of the siblings as well. Okay, so we're talking about um, paying attention and Crystal mentioned behavioral momentum so they don't have time to think about how hard something is or how much they don't wanna do something. But we know that oftentimes schoolwork may not be a very preferred activity for our kiddos um, and it may be something that they actually really don't, they just hate. And so when we talk about presenting a non-preferred activity, it's good to be prepared. If you know that they have to do something they don't want to do, it's good to right away, when you say you have to do it, you, you also present two choices for them to choose so they have some say in what they can, they're supposed to do and what they can do and what they want to do. For example, if it's time to read, because let's say your child has to read one book a week. I don't know how much kids have to read these days, but that's one book a week. And you say, hey, it's time to read. Do you want to read Paw Patrol or Peppa Pig? And if you have those two books in your hands, ready to go, that's even better because it's very clear for them, like these are your choices. And of course, if they want to make a different choice, that's okay. Um, but this allows them to see like, hey, obviously you're going to make me read regardless. <laughs> I just, at least I get to choose which book I want to read. Don't wait until they protest to give them the choices. Don't wait until they say, hey, that's not fair. And you're like, you, you know what? Do you want this book or this book? Um, because at that point, then it's, they have negotiating power and they can also say, I don't want to. <laughs> I, I'm not gonna read any of those books. I don't like any of the ones you just gave me. And then you can also give choices for other things. So it, it doesn't have to be like, it doesn't have to be just books. It doesn't have to be just the, uh, um, the assignments itself, but you can think about where, um, where they're sitting. So you ha it's nice to have a space where um, it's dedicated to the, to the classroom or to learning, but sometimes maybe your child wants to sit on a beanbag or if you have one of those chairs that wobble that don't really stay still, maybe they want to sit on those. Um, maybe they want to try using a different type of writing tool. So crayons, markers, different colors, they can choose that. They can also choose uh, where they want to start an activity or which activity they want to go start with first. So some of our kids will have multiple assignments that they have to do and maybe they can choose if today they want to do math or tomorrow, if they want to do it um, where if they have a worksheet, they want to start at number one or they want to start at number 10, um, somewhere down the line start on the left or on the right, whatever it may be. Um, going back to reading, if they want to read it in a really silly voice, they want to be really scary, if they want to be loud or quiet when they read it, um, you can decide if you read one page and they read one page or if they read the, like the really fun parts, but they listen when you, when you read um, the not so fun parts, the parts that don't go boom, pow, bang. Um, maybe they want to, you know, read the wow parts. Um, so those are some things that you, that they can choose within just learning themselves. And that would likely make the non-preferred activity not so non-preferred um, because they do have some say and some choice and autonomy in that. You might want to also consider giving choices for preferred activities. And this would allow them to one, get used to having and making choices, and two, also realize that this is their learning opportunity. This is for them as well. It's not about you controlling what they have to do and what they don't have to do. Um, 
and it's for them to be like, hey, all of this is something that you get to have a say in. It's just that there are some things that are non-negotiable and I'll let you know when it's non-negotiable and I'll let you know when it is negotiable and when you have those choices. And so they get used to this, okay, when mom says or when dad says, I have to do this, I have to do this, but hey, I can choose if I want to read with my favorite Barbie or it, I can choose if I want to circle my worksheet using circles um, or they can use squares maybe if that's an option instead of circle color, color red they can just square it they can star it whatever it is as long as you know that they they chose the right one and then other choices that are not quite super ABA but um, maybe interesting for you to think about would be just choosing like computer brightness. I know for me, if I'm sitting at my laptop for two or three hours on end, I cannot stay with the same brightness setting for whatever reason. And that may be the same for your child. Um, maybe they want to use headphones or earbuds to listen to the teacher. Um, there are also these headbands that are supposed to be really soft and they have speakers embedded in them that could be more helpful and more comfortable than headphones. Um, you might want to consider that your child wants to adjust the volume now and then. Um, so just things like that that would really increase their comfort, even blue light uh, filter app on your computer could be helpful if your child is sitting at the computer for five, six hours a day uh, learning so that they're not having so much eye strain. All right. Thank you, Tammy. Yeah, providing choices is such a good tool that we use with so many families, um, being able to give that power to the child a little bit when they're not used to maybe making choices on their own. Um, it can really help them with a lot of transitions and it can help them be able to feel like they're just making some of these choices on their own rather than being forced to do all these things that they don't want to do. Um, okay, so another strategy is just trying to catch the little victories. I know it can be so easy to focus on um, all these negative things that our children are doing, um, but trying to catch these little things that they are doing right can be so helpful and so beneficial. So first starting with um, trying to figure out what motivates your child. This is so individualized and um, really figuring out like what is it that, what can we utilize in order to encourage them to attend, in order to help them feel a little bit more engaged and to get them a little bit more excited for maybe something that they are motivated for um, after whatever that hard and challenging activity is. So figuring out maybe it is, um, maybe it is time on the iPad when it's all done. Maybe it's a special little treat that's reserved for just after distance learning is over. Um, Anything that kind of helps your child along can really be used to your advantage and to help that child just attend a little bit more. Um, it can really encourage to increase some of that good behavior that we want to see um, and kind of catching some of those, those instances where we're like, wow, he is doing really awesome sitting today. He is really focusing on a screen, like catching those little things and really trying to um, reward that, even if that is just in the middle of the day being like, oh, awesome job. You're sitting so nicely, giving some squeezes if they're into squeezes, giving a little bit of praise, um, just being able to reinforce when we can, obviously without being too distracting to the rest of the environment. But um, I think it's super important too, to allow the child to choose what they're motivated for. So sometimes I think it can be easy for us to be like, okay, here, when you're done with this, you get this. And it's like, well, maybe they don't want that today. Maybe they want something different. So providing that choice ahead of time, like, okay, after distance learning, what do we want to do? Or what, what snack do you want? Or what special toy do you want to play with afterward? Allowing them to have that choice to think about it. Um, be like, oh, this is what I want. Or um, sometimes with the visuals that can help too. So going into the first then statements, um, talking about like, okay, first, sit 10 minutes or first computer, then special snack or play with cars. Um, something to where they are able to see that very clear contingency of, okay, first this is what I need to do, then I can have access to this super fun thing or um, 
super fun activity, the snack, um, or just even a fun break. And then um, using, especially with the visuals, making those statements, using reinforcement schedules as well. So um, this doesn't have to look like a fancy token board like we use, like which you might see in ABA sometimes where we have the Velcro and everything. This can just be a piece of paper with stars on it. It can be giving some stickers every now and then. Um, it can be little squares where every minute that they're sitting, they can get a little figurine on the squares. Once you get all five of the figurines, then you can play with them. Um, it can look totally different depending on what your child likes um, and what motivates them, what might be visually appealing to them and very easy for them to see without being terribly distracting. Um, also, just having those visuals in general can be super, super beneficial. Having that token board right away so that they can see, okay, I need five and then I can take a break. Um, and spontaneously catching that, those behaviors, that can also look like, depending on, like we discussed before, if your child is able to sit for only 10 minutes, we know that that's their threshold, maybe let's catch them at nine minutes, give them that quick and positive reinforcement until, before they reach that threshold, before we know that they're going to start running away from the table or laying down on the floor or um, just engaging in some of those behaviors that we see that aren't quite compatible with attending. So trying to catch it beforehand, really be proactive with that when you can. Um, and I know this is this can be really difficult taking that time to do that and to catch those positive behaviors that we see. Um, if it's easier for you, it could even be just setting a timer for yourself and being like, okay, every 10 minutes, if I see that he's sitting and engaging, I'm going to walk over there and I'm going to provide praise or I'll provide like a special little treat, something that's not distracting. Um, even being able to catch something like that every once in a while is better than having not really reinforcing some of those positive things that we see. So catching even just the, the little wins, the little victories. That proactivity is super key um, since we do tend to focus on, on the negative. Sometimes we see all of these negative behaviors, but really trying to focus on the behavior that we do want to improve and figuring out how we can reinforce that can be beneficial. I do want to add something about setting a timer for yourself um, is that if your child can hear your timer go off every 10 minutes, uh, that may be a trigger for them to start paying attention or to start doing their work. So be warned. Yes, absolutely. I know some people have the watches where it just like buzzes a little bit um, or a timer on your phone that just will vibrate quietly. That could be beneficial. I agree. That could be pretty distracting for the child. Okay, and then going a little bit more in depth in those visual supports. So again, these can look so different. They don't have to be printed out if you don't have those resources or if you just don't have the time to do it. Um, we can, visual schedules are something that we can work where depending on your child's needs or abilities, if we can just write down the schedule in order, that is super awesome. And then tying back into what Tammy talked about with choices, try to have your child participate with that schedule a little bit if it's possible. So we can be like, okay, right here, we're doing distance learning. But after this, we can either do this or this and having them create that schedule with you so that they feel a little bit more in control of that schedule during these times where children just feel like they have no control over the situation, um, which we all feel that way. But um, Also, again, having the timers. Timers are our best friend. They can help with transition. So rather than abruptly being like, okay, it's time for a table, we have to go, being able to prepare them with those timers, um, being like, okay, we have one more minute or we have five more minutes, giving those warnings a little bit. Um, the timers can be a visual for how long they have to sit for. It can be really difficult for children to be like, I have no idea how long they have to sit and attend for. They have no idea when it's going to end. They don't know if if they can get a break when they want, it can be so difficult to know those expectations. So being able to have these visuals, have it the timer that counts down, or um, the visual that we have here on the screen with the duck. For apps, we have apps, I think, um, if you type into like Google Play, 
visual timer, things like that will pop up where it's a little bit easier for them to see the time go down a little bit too. So things like that can really be beneficial. Um, same with the first then. I know we discussed that before, but there's a visual here on this page that shows a little bit what that looks like. So it can be just drawings of two pictures um, paired with that vocal of like, okay, first we're going to go on the computer or first we'll do homework, then we get that snack or then we get the iPad. Um, being able to give those clear expectations can help that way they have a little bit of an understanding of those expectations and what's gonna happen and when. Anything that can help make those instructions even just a little bit clearer can really be beneficial. Um, a lot of times what I try to use with our learners is um, a rule visual. So if a child is able to follow along with the written rules, or even if they're not, a lot of times they'll start to memorize the rules um, after that repetition of being like, okay, don't forget our rules when we're sitting is stay in our chair. We need to have a calm voice and we need to be looking at the screen, something like that or not looking at the screen, depending on what attending looks like for your child. But um, being able to have just those clear little rules so that we can reference them, we can um, provide that right from the beginning, like don't forget, this is what we have to do, these are our rules. Or if they do get a little bit off track, we can easily come over, provide a gesture to the little um, rule visual and be like, oh, don't forget, we need to stay in our seat or we can ask for a break. Um, just providing those visuals can be very, very helpful. Um, so, sorry, I just wanted to jump. That, that timer with the duck, um, I've actually used myself, and I don't want to necessarily plug the app, but um, I do like it because the image that's revealed at the end, you, your child can choose what picture that is, and that can also be motivating for them to be to, to have that. And um, they have different sounds at the end, so that's really fun. Also, the timer goes from green to yellow to red as the time goes down. So they can not only uh, see that it's ticking down, but they can see that, oh, red is getting really close. I need to be prepared to transition. And one of my favorite things is you can turn off the ticking sound or you can turn it on, um, depending on if that ticking sound is distracting for your child or not, or for you even, because I find it to be quite annoying. <laughs> That's a great tip. Um, for sure, we should include some of these timers in our resources for parents too, because I, I think that becomes really challenging too, is feeling like there's either not enough out there or there's too much. So that's a really, really helpful tip. And like you said too, Tammy, like you can choose the visual, which I think is really valuable for our clients to um, have some ownership over the activity. I'm going to choose the duck today. And then what the duck does is it shows up. Oh, the duck's almost here. Hurry, hurry, hurry. So there's some really great uh, supports with some of these things that can be a little bit more motivating than just, um, you know, numbers ticking down and things like that. Great point. Um, we talked about this in series one, so I'm not going to talk about this too much, but I felt it was really important to really reemphasize the importance of why we use visuals. Uh, we talk a lot about the importance of visuals to keeping uh, children organized and certainly supportive to other uh, kiddos that may be in the home that might benefit from them as well. The idea behind visuals too is that visuals are permanent. So if you're saying something to your child and maybe they don't hear it, then that's something that is tricky. Oh, remember, like Miss Crystal said, these are our rules today. I told you the rules at the beginning of the game, or I told you the rules at the beginning of our, of our session today. Let's remember what the rules are. So them being permanent is really supportive in being consistent for kids too. Visuals also travel. So everybody at home, if mom's doing distance learning on Monday, dad's doing it on Tuesday, older siblings doing it Wednesday. If we use a consistent visual across people, then that helps support your child even more. Another big thing at home during distance learning, which I'm sure a lot of you are experiencing, is there's a bit of a, of a head butting and so maybe some, some um, needs for control. So it's mom's making me do this, dad's making me do this. I don't wanna do that. I don't do school at home, I do it at school. So what visuals can support with is they kind of have done here at the bottom, they don't have an attitude, it's objective. The visual says it's time to get ready for school. The visual says it's time to work on your math homework. The visual says it's time to sit and hear your teacher during circle time. 
it's not mom saying it, it's the visual. So what this also supports too is a little bit better of a connection during these times. Visuals can support, make, make expectations really clear, but it also creates some objectivity um, in what the expectations are today. Uh, can't argue with the visual. I'm just one person trying to follow the rules. So I think it's really valuable to recognize that these pieces are really supportive for a lot of different reasons. And also to recognizing where your child is at um, cognitively and what's their, what's supportive for them. Processing um, you know, verbal and spoken language is very different than visuals. Um, so for some kiddos, this helps reinforce what's being said, said to them. So I think visuals have a lot of real power. Um, and I think that this little visual itself does a really nice job of describing exactly why we think they're so valuable and important. Speaking of visuals, so in occupational therapy, um, we talk a lot about uh, uh, visual input and how we process things visually from a sensory processing perspective. We're also going to talk about, um, we also talk a lot about visual motor skills a lot in OT. Um, I don't want to delve too much into this topic right now because we are going to save that a little bit more for our series three in a couple of weeks where we're talking about more of these fine motor visual motor activities that we're going to be doing at home. But it's important kind of like how Crystal and Tammy have mentioned that things can feel overwhelming for a lot of reasons for kids. And one way that we can break tasks up to make them feel more manageable is by doing it visually. So for example, if the activity is to um, work on a, a piece of paper, we need to do some writing. This particular paper is perhaps overwhelming. There's lots of lines. There's an expectation that I'm supposed to fill that page. Oh my goodness. Plus then when we're working on handwriting, it just feels a little bit overwhelming for some of our clients. So something as simple as adapting the paper. Maybe we grab a highlighter and highlight just the lines of the paper that we need to be addressing. This particular paper is also um, really helpful for kiddos that are having challenges with handwriting, which we are for sure going to be talking about in our series three. Um, but this is one way to help break things up visually for kiddos to help support them when we're doing these really seemingly laborious tasks at, uh, for distance learning. Another, whoa, another example, another challenge too is, um, let's say we're doing a math worksheet or a worksheet in general. This feels overwhelming for children, even if the tasks are really simple. Visually, this feels overwhelming. So one strategy we use a lot in OT, and I'm certain it's the same in ABA, is we might fold the paper. So when we present the child with what we're doing in the moment during that time frame, we're only going to present half of this page or a fourth of this page. See if you can get these done first. Then we might take a break or we might do something else, and we're going to come back and now we're flipped the page over, and we're going to work on the other part that's folded. These are ways to visually break down tasks to make it feel more successful. As Crystal was mentioning too, that the little successes build to bigger successes. So the more options for kids to feel successful is gonna allow them to work harder. Another option too that we use a lot of times in OT are things like this um, reader. Um, reading can be challenging for a lot of our kiddos if we're of reading age. And so one way to break down things visually is another way to use these kind of readers. Um, you know, certainly, you know, reading using our finger to trace what the line that we're reading is one supportive tool. This is another. And there's a lot out there. Simple adaptations to the environment or the way things tasks are presented can allow kids to feel a little bit more willing to complete them if it feels manageable. So there's just a couple strategies here. Okay, so um, as we mentioned earlier, Shelby and Angela had presented uh, last week, a couple of weeks ago, something like that, <laughs> um, the first part of this series, um, and they talked about breaks. So we just wanted to go back to that again, because breaks are so important in ensuring your child's success and keeping everyone sane. And so there are different reasons why um, you might have a break. You might use it as reinforcement. Uh, Shelby mentioned using it as uh, like, hey, first you do this and then you can have this awesome activity or do this awesome activity. So it's reinforcing so they're engaged and they're excited and they're motivated, as Crystal mentioned earlier, um, to get their work done. You can have breaks that are scheduled in just to break up that work because we do know that if your child has to sit there for two, three, four, five, six hours a day, uh, it doesn't make sense to expect them to sit there the whole time without breaks. And even if your child doesn't say, say to you, hey, I need a break, or doesn't tell you or show you that they need a break, it's likely that their brain needs that break. Um, 
So their breaks can look very different depending on your child's needs. Some children, um, as Chris mentioned earlier, may need more breaks, more frequent breaks, um, maybe even longer breaks. Some children may need, uh, may not need so many breaks, maybe not every 10 minutes, but maybe every half an hour, maybe every hour. And the timing can also really affect it. So affect how it, the breaks look, because um, if it's structured, I mean, if it's, if it's structured in a way that's like, hey, right now, after we do this, these activities, you can do this, um, you may have had time to set up things, if it's necessary to set things up, to go to run to the store, to grab their favorite snack, whatever it is. If it's spontaneous and it, it's just, oh, you look really tired right now, let's take a break. Um, maybe you don't have time to set up, but you're still able to do something fun. Uh, it's just, it'll, it'll look different for you. So breaks can be, um, again, reinforcing, they can be scheduled, they can be fun and they can be super structured where it's like, hey, we have five minutes, we're gonna do this, da da da. Um, or they can be, well, we can come back in seven to 10 minutes, but you do kind of want to set that time because you don't want your child to come back three hours later, having forgotten all about their work. Um, so you just, the, the, sorry, the length amount of time that you actually uh, give to them is it, probably going to change in how structured it's going to be if they're going to do a certain activity that requires them to follow rules. If, um, they're going to play games with you if it's going to look like you your break is going to be stretches and a dance <laughs> like dance to some song um just a breather or if the break is going to look like playing with siblings going outside um those are all things that are going to vary depending on your the needs and um also when you decide to have these breaks there we go going into the breaks just a little bit more um so like Tammy said, these can be automatically pre-scheduled. So maybe again, we know how long our children can sit for. Maybe we'll try to go just a little bit before that threshold and take that break just to avoid the running away from the table, avoid some of those negative behaviors and trying to proactively prompt taking a break. So that um, might look like, hey, like Tammy said, you look like you're getting a little bit tired. Let's go take a break. Those proactive strategies can help and they can um, teach the children like, hey, I can appropriately ask for a break um, rather than choosing to run away in order to get my break or rather than choosing to starting to throw a bunch of things or maybe dropping onto the floor or engaging in some of these behaviors that we don't necessarily want to see to lead to a break. So what we could do is we could schedule the breaks ahead of time. If maybe you're like, you know what, we are taking way too many breaks. This just isn't feasible. Um, something you can try is having a solidified amount of breaks ahead of time and with a visual and being like, okay, yesterday we took 15 breaks. Today, we're only going to take 12 breaks. You can have little boxes and you can check off after every break. After 12, you can be like, oh, you know what, I don't think we can take a break right now, but we only have five minutes left. Let's sit for five more minutes and then we can take another break for making sure that that expectation is super clear. Um, but your child might need more breaks depending on the day. They might be extra fatigued one day. Um, I think encouraging our children to sit for such long periods of time can be really stressful on them and it can be nearly impossible for some children and for some families in general. So being able to set those realistic expectations. Um, going back to the visuals, we can use a card to signal a break. So it can be something that we, it can be if your child's able to read, just something that says break, they're able to look at it, it's available right next to them and they're able to see, oh, hey, I can take a break. Or if a child is not vocal, teaching them to just touch the card to ask for a break, that would be way more appropriate than running around and, um, trying to get breaks that way, reinforcing that appropriate request like, hey, I need a break real quick because that's appropriate for all of us. Um, and again, recognizing those I need a break signals before they escalate, just again, back to that proactivity. Um, what a break should look like, Tammy touched on this a bit, but think saving highly preferred activities for later can be beneficial if we're in the middle of a Zoom call. So 
trying to avoid maybe if the iPad is something that's super difficult to transition from, maybe let's save that since it's super motivating and reinforcing, saving that for the end just to get them to push just a little bit further, um, having more of that structure in between those sessions where they're able to choose what they can do within reason, um, things that might not be terribly, terribly hard to transition from because then we might just set ourselves up to have more difficulties when we're trying to get back. So some signs to look for when your child needs a break. Um, we know that distance learning is fatiguing for a lot of reasons. What we used to do in person is now done via the computer, like our webinar this evening. And so we, we understand that Zoom fatigue is that kind of buzzword these days is a real thing. Um, therapy, uh, calls with grandparents, um, and now school are all done virtually. So some things to really look for first and foremost is overload. Um, kids will let you know they're overloaded pretty quickly. You'll see them, there'll be lots of blinking, rubbing their eyes and head, sitting very slumped in their seat, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about ways to support them. Um, so that's one way that you can tell. Another thing is kids are extra silly. Oh, I can't sit still anymore, so I'm having a really challenging time attending, and now I'm gonna be really silly. So now my sibling who might, be a, who might have been bothering me before, now I'm calling them over. I'm really wanting that distraction and being extra silly, because it's just hard for kids to attend for a long period of time. You might see kids feeling extra bored, extra zoned out. We talked a lot about the ways in which we can look for attention and how we can support attention. So certainly that's a pretty clear indicator that it's they need a break. Another thing too is that upset. Like Crystal mentioned, coming back from a break is already stressful enough and now you're seeing lots more upset. Upset and emotion, frustration going back to work. Oh, I have to go back on another Zoom call. Or maybe your child is in middle school age is now alternating between Zoom rooms, whereas maybe they were alternated between classrooms. So there's lots of things to look for. What we encourage in terms of uh, breaks is there's a way to allow for breaks and there's a way to kind of push for more work to be done. And really that's gonna be subjective to your child and the situation. Some tips and tricks we think are helpful are recognizing that harder tasks or tasks that require more effort from your child, seeing about making them shorter or allowing for more breaks. This can allow your child those little successes and give them a break when you feel they need it. If the task is easier, they get fewer breaks. Um, recognizing the signs of needing a break. Every child is specific and different and you know your children so much better than we do. So, we, so ways in which you can be a detective along the way, because we know that these tantrums or these meltdowns or these frustrations are culminations of little signs along the way. So also to recognizing that everybody has a threshold, parents included. So really recognizing the need for a break for everybody in the home. Um, and certainly, you know, chunking activities or breaking them into smaller, more manageable steps at the start. Crystal and Tim mentioned that maybe we need to schedule breaks, recognize that you're going to get a break at this time, this time, this time, and this time. But there may be a need for the different types of breaks. So sometimes a break is a true vacation. I could do whatever I want. Sometimes, as Tammy mentioned too, there are breaks that are highly structured. We're going to do something really quick and then come right back. So in OT, a lot of our breaks are related to movement. We want our, we want, we understand that these signs and symptoms for kiddos are a, 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 note, um, a sign to us of, of these, these frustrations or things that our kids are showing us are signs we need to move our bodies. Moving our bodies is a supportive way to helping our bodies learn and helping our brains retain more information for longer periods. There's a lot of different things that are out that are available to you, both, you know, working with your occupational therapist or your ABA staff or your speech and language pathologist or anybody else in your life that might support you in this way. Um, there's also, you know, tips and tricks that are available more readily. Um, in OT, we use things called brain breaks. Um, Tammy kind of touched on them a little bit earlier, talking about how we're going to go, we're going to do 10 jumping jacks and then we're going to come back and sit down. Um, your therapy source, which is a group um, online, has created something called the brain break machine. What's really wonderful about this is we can press play. So we're gonna press play on this break break machine and you see how it's scrolling through. Now I'm gonna pause, whoa, where did my pause go? Now I'm gonna pause, oh, here we go. I landed on an exercise. We're gonna separate your legs, reach one hand down your leg and reach the other into the sky. Hold for five seconds and then repeat. 
This is a quick brain break. Oh, we have another brain break. Here we go. Click. And we're on to the next. So what's important to know is some of these breaks are incorporating movement, but they're intended to be quick, fast, um, you know, recharges to then sit down and do more work. This gets in, I guess that's into posture. Um, your posture, your child's position and posture are important to consider. We talk a lot about this in our series one of these three series um, that we did. And recognizing the importance that posture and position may change depending upon the tax, tasks being completed. So in, in, in therapy, in occupational therapy, we focus a lot on supportive posture. So small changes in your home environment can make a big uh, uh, impact on your child's success. So supportive postures. If your child has challenges already with fine motor skills or challenges with um, writing or whatever the other kind of mechanical expectations are of those distance learning activities, supportive sitting is the best way to encourage success. So what we're looking for, obviously, in a very perfect world, is that 90-90-90 posture. When we're talking about 90-90-90, we're looking at the hip position, the knee position, and the foot placement. The idea here is that supportive posture and supported, uh, excuse me, supportive seating are going to allow that stable base to allow your child to be successful with fine motor tasks. We're going to talk a lot about this next week as well, or in two weeks at our next series. Um, but some strategies and tips to do right away. If your child's sitting on the floor, consider maybe a lap desk. This will, this will bring the surface up to your child and still create a supportive sitting position. A lot of us are having kids sit at dining room tables, bar setups, things that are higher off the ground. For example, this kiddo right here is sitting in a really lovely booster seat, but his feet are dangling. If your child has challenges with fine motor skills, the importance for supported sitting is most valuable here by just changing subtle things here. So you can see that now what we have here is instead of the slumped position with our feet dangling, we've now brought in over a stool to support the feet, encourage that 90, 90, 90, and now we have a much greater upright posture that sets him up for greater success to be able to use the crayon or the pencil or the scissors or the keyboard or whatever else that we're having your child do. So if you can't bring them down to the ground for supported seating, consider bringing the ground up to meet them. We also recognize too that we're talking a lot today about attention. So there's different postures that can support attention that may not be as supportive for fine motor skills. So it's highly dependent upon the task that we're doing. If we're engaging in circle time where the teacher is leading the activity and they're singing songs or reading a book or instructions are happening over the, the screen where your child doesn't have to actively complete work, you might consider these things to support success. Things like movable surfaces, using a ball at home. We use these air cushions a lot in occupational therapy. Um, there are ways to keep our feet wiggling. This is a TheraBand, those resistive bands tied at the bottom of the chair so our feet can bounce, so our bodies can attend and learn. Some other positions to consider as laying on your tummy with the uh, tablet or the, um, or the activity in front of them. This again is changing their posture and position from this upright seated expectation. That can be very fatiguing. Some other fun things to consider too might be reclined sitting. Um, this in particular, this little kiddo is set up in a really wonderful hammock. It's a sheet tied around the top of, a, um, of a, the dining table. And then the child is underneath the table in this reclined position. They're still having the opportunity to learn and engage, but we're putting them in a position that's gonna allow for much greater attention with subtle movements during the activity. This can be really, really valuable and it helps break up something without immediately relieving yourself of the activity. So, oh, I'm tired, I'm bored, great. Let's get in the hammock. Great, we're going to go sit on the ball. And then you're still going to listen to what the teacher has to say. These are important, valuable tools with just subtle um, shifts in the environment that can still allow your child to be successful in distance learning. I love that. I like that. Um, it kind of teaches us to be a little bit flexible, too. Typically with our standards, we're like, okay, we have to be sitting down this whole time in this chair at this desk. And you know what? Sometimes we just might need a break and we might want to recline and sit a little bit in some other ways to support that attending and support um, that posture. And that's, that's so cool to be able to have that flexible thinking a little bit and um, try those different strategies with your children. We're all in this together, being flexible, we have to be. So that's a really um, 
really great word, <laughs> Crystal, is that flexibility of thought in a lot of this distance learning. It's just getting through some of this stuff sometimes. Yeah, definitely. Which brings us to our next slide. So individualize your expectations, be flexible with your child. Um, we understand that some of these strategies might not work exactly for you. We can try to individualize some of these, individualize those visuals, um, the use of the timer based on your child's and your needs. Um, we know a lot of parents are working right now too, and that just presents a whole bunch of different um, difficulties. So just trying what you can to use some of these strategies as you can. Um, also advocating for your child and celebrating those little wins. So being able to maybe reach out to your teacher, see if they have any strategies, or if you are an ABA, reach out to your supervisor and be like, hey, look, this isn't working for us. What could we do instead? Um, how can we integrate more of those breaks? How can we ensure that we're doing what's best for our children? Um, it can be very easy. Sometimes I've found that some parents are focusing on some of the other children in the Zoom too, and they're like, hey, this child is sitting for so much longer, or maybe this child is like looking at the screen the whole time, but instead focusing on your child's strengths, your child's motivation and your needs and trying to celebrate even just those little wins. Um, and again, expect the unexpected, be flexible um, in, by individualizing these needs for your child. Like Angela said, all those different positions that you can use rather than just expecting them to stay at the table the whole time. Um, it can help us be flexible and it can help your children as well. Um, so we're gonna keep really drilling in that whole flexible thing. <laughs> um, sorry, Angela, I think I interrupted you. Um, and so we really want you to like go easy on yourself. I mean, be flexible with your kids, but be, but be flexible with yourself as well. It's not gonna be um, like everything's gonna go out the way that you want it to. It's never, it never works out that way. And I'm sure as parents, you know that it just does not work out the way you want it to. So understand that you are a person too, and you have limits and you also have a threshold and you may need breaks. So take your deep breath. Um, when you offer choices to your child, offer what's available. So don't stress over it too much um, with like, oh, I know they would definitely work for ice cream, but I have no ice cream at home. Um, don't worry about that. Let's go look for something else. Um, don't forget to model for your kids. Um, if you can, if you are working from home and you're sitting with your child working on your laptop while they're on their tablet, um, you can also sit there for however many, how much time and then go, you know what? I need a break. Stand up, be very obvious about it. Do all your stretches, um, sit back down, go back to work. And then your kid gets to see like, Hey, I can do that. That's a little silly, but I can do that. Um, and Again, if you want support, if you want to talk to, um, if you're working, if you're with MeV right now, you want to talk to your ABA supervisor, if you want to talk to OT, um, to just figure out like how we can help you individualize these tasks and um, these methods, absolutely go for it. Talk to your child's teacher. Um, sometimes your teacher may not really be aware of your child's needs. Um, maybe you have tips to give the teacher of how they can help set your child up for success. Um, and maybe they can work with you to modify um, the way they're working with things. Again, we just wanna thank you so much for your time this evening. Um, we really value the time that you spend with us. We certainly hope that these strategies and suggestions have been helpful to you. Um, definitely uh, reach out to us with any questions you have. We realize that a lot of these strategies and suggestions can be truly individual for you and your family. So we really appreciate your time this evening. Um, you can always catch our webinars on uh, mebefamily.com. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at mebefamily for more quick tips in our stories and our Instagram TV. And um, we are here uh, for those of you that have any questions this evening. Um, so certainly um, enter them in the chat box if you'd like, and we're here to offer some more individual suggestions if need be. All right, and I'll be monitoring the chat box. Um, we have had several people who've said, thank you so much. This has been really helpful. So just to give you guys some immediate positive feedback, we've had a lot of people who've, who've chatted and said, thank you. Uh, we're getting some more come in right now. So thank you so much. Um, so I really appreciate that. I, I am gonna just add, 
do one more little poll here for you to give us some feedback. It's really helpful for us to hear from you as we're planning more of these maybe learning webinars. Um, you know, how helpful was this today? So I just put that poll up. Um, lots of people have stuck around with us this evening. We appreciate your time so much. Um, so if you can give us some feedback on the poll and please feel free to enter in any questions in the chat box as well. Um, several thank yous. So you guys have done a wonderful job presenting a lot of helpful information. So thank you so much. All right, more thank yous are rolling in. We have a happy crowd this evening. You guys have been great. <laughs> All right, I'll uh, share the poll. Very help incredibly helpful, very helpful and pretty helpful. So <laughs> that's great. So thank you so much. Um, I am just gonna check in and see. I'll give everybody a minute in case there are any questions. I know we've got a few during the presentation. I think we were able to get to those. Um, I don't see any more coming in yet. So uh, we will be signing off. I will send out that follow-up email to everybody tomorrow with the link to the recording as well as the PowerPoint slides. Um, so you should get that in your inbox tomorrow. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us. We have our next webinars with Angela on October 1st about fine motor skills and things that you can do to practice at home. I know that's been a popular topic. We already have a lot of people signed up for that one. So if you haven't yet, make sure you sign up too. Um, so we will be signing off. Have a good rest of your evening and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.